Amen. Amen. Our topic for today is the book of Revelation, the end result, part four. And our subtopic is the art of worship. Hallelujah, Jesus. The art of worship. Now, the Holy Spirit led me to the definition of the word art, A-R-T. We have all used this word, but very few understand its meaning. So I'm going to read to you the definition of the word art. It is the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination. Typically, in a visual form, such as painting or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. The word art is affiliated with emotional power. When we are worshiping, we gain emotional power. When we're lifting up the name of Jesus, not just in song, but in the way we live, the things we do, and the things we don't do anymore, we're worshiping God with our lifestyle. And that gives us emotional power because it makes us closer to God. We feel a closer relationship with him. And when the devil come and, you know, try to get us to do certain things with us, rebuke him. That's the blood of Jesus. And like, I have a close relationship with my wife because I know there's no other woman on the side. There's just none. So that's a good thing. When a guy is fooling around on his wife, he don't have that same closeness with his wife. There's always something that creates a wedge. And it may not be a physical you know, adultery alone. It could be something emotional, playing around, flirting with someone. You know, some married man, you know, it's sad to say, people tell me things, but they're in bed with their wife thinking of somebody else. That is bad. That is bad. Okay? That's not good. And some people, there are, I'm watching another, before you start judging that person, there are some people in church thinking about the devil's work. No, you're having spiritual adultery. Oh, he didn't know I was going to go there. All right. Come back to me. Come back, come back, come back. We're going we're gonna to jump in the book of Revelation before I start stepping on so many toes because I started hearing the ouches already. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 is where we continue our series. And it's dealing with worship in heaven. So let's read from verses 1 to 3. And then we'll go through some stuff here. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here. And I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly, I was in the spirit. And I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Now, you got to remember that... This is what Ezekiel saw. And for those who may not have been here for that part, let me just show you in Ezekiel. We'll come back to Revelation 3. But go with me to Ezekiel, chapter, Revelation 4 rather. But go with me, come back to, um, go with me to Ezekiel rather, 1. Ezekiel 1. And no, he's not called Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel. <laughs> Yeah, some people don't understand what they're reading. I heard people call them that before. Oh, I'm reading Easy Kill. I said, Easy Kill? That don't sound right. <laughs> All right. Ezekiel chapter 1. Look at verses 26 to 28. After this surface was something that, above this surface rather, not after, above the surface was something that looked like a throne made of blue lapis lazuli. And on this throne, 
High above was a figure whose appearance resembled a man. From what appeared to his waist up, he looked like gleaming amber flickering like a fire. And from his waist down, he looked like a burning flame shining with splendor. Now all around him was a glowing halo like a rainbow shining in the clouds on a rainy day. This is what the glory of the Lord looked like to me when I saw it. I fell face down to the ground and heard someone's voice speaking to me. So the same thing John saw, Ezekiel saw the same vision. And he's like, man, this is great. Now, let's go back to Revelation 4. And we'll talk some more. I just want you guys to see that contrast that John is not the only person that saw the Son of Man on the throne. Now, let's look at verse 4. All right? It says this. Revelation 4, verse 4. It says, 24 thrones surrounded him, and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. Now stop for a second. I want you guys to know this. The white robes, they represent purity of heart. Purity of heart. If your heart's not right, if you're not pure, you are not going to see God in the right way. Purity of heart. Someone's going to get on your nerves every single day, whether on the job, whether in the supermarket, it could be in your house, right? If you're married, guess what? Your husband's going to get on your nerves and your wife going to get on your nerves. That's the way it is. But love should overshadow that, okay? You're going to always have an opportunity to hold things in your heart, but don't take that opportunity. That's an opportunity from the devil, which is going to lead to a calamity. The opportunity you should take is the forgiveness one. When we're quick to forgive, when someone do something to arm us or to, to, to hurt our feelings, let it go. Let it go. You got to know what to keep and what not to keep. It's like anybody ever eat sugar cane? The, the real sugar cane, not just drink the juice, but eat the sugar cane. Peel it and eat it. All right? One thing you don't want to do is swallow the trash. Trash is not good. You'll be choking. All right? You, you eat the sugar cane and you... Take the juice out of it, you swallow that, but the trash, you spit out. And that's how we got to deal with the junk the devil present to us. Try to distract our authentic lifestyle of worship. We spit out that trash and say, uh, I'm not going to swallow that. The blood of Jesus. I've risen above that. We got to think above, not below. The devil is going to come with temptations and distractions and all these things, but we got to say, uh-uh not going out like that. I'm going to keep a pure heart. Remember what Matthew 5 says? You know, only the pure in heart shall see God. Matthew 5 and 8. Only the pure in heart shall see God. <laughs> All right. Let's continue. Key point number one. Write this down. Oh, before, before I go, also the gold crowns. I want to go verse by verse. So you guys truly understand Revelation. Anybody want to understand Revelation? Oh, yeah. Hallelujah, Jesus. So the white robes represent purity of heart that the 24 elders have, but also the crown represents their royalty. Their royalty. All right? And we who are of a royal priesthood because we are saved, because we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, we are now princes and princesses in the kingdom. We're royalty. Now, one thing that's fascinating about royalty, royalty don't go around worrying about their provisions. Prince Charles, Prince William, all these princes, they don't go around, the, the princesses, they don't go around worrying Ma'am, I wonder if I'm going to get my bills paid this month. I wonder if I can get some food today. I wonder if I'm going to have a car. They don't worry about that stuff. In England, let's take England for instance. The government of England give the royal family millions and millions and millions at their, you know, for their pleasure every year. Every year. More than 50 million that they get. To just do whatever they want to do. They don't really have political 
strength. I mean, they value the queen's, you know, suggestion and stuff like that. But the real power stands with the prime minister and the cabinet. But the royal family is just there for people to look at and say, whoa, they're royalty. And they just give them everything they want. Now, let's fast forward that to us now. We who are in Christ Jesus, we are royalty. Amen. So when we walk, let us walk like royal priesthood. Amen. When we talk, let us talk like royal priesthood. Amen. Dress the part, look the part, speak the part, look and talk like Jesus. Amen. Don't think you are second best. You're not. You know, second best to nobody. You're royalty. Most people don't live a certain way because they don't know who they are. There's a story back in the day about a lion that was raised with chickens. And the lion thought he was a chicken. And he was walking around, eating off the ground and, you know, hanging out with the chicken and all that. Until one day he went to a river. And he looked in the river and he realized he don't look like the chicken. He saw a mirror of himself. And it's like, I'm not like them. And then he started living as a king of his dominion. You see, if you don't know who you are, you won't know how to live. People go out doing all sorts of manner of sinful things. That's because they don't know that they are royal priesthood and they have a crown reserved for them in heaven. Amen. How dare you trample on your crown of righteousness? You put thousands of dollars in the bank and your spiritual bank you left wide open for Satan to come and steal your crown? That's ridiculous to me. You got to know who you are. And then you will know how to live. I don't like the word how to act. I leave the act into Hollywood. We are Christians. We live. It's not just an act. Because people put on an act and it's phony. They smile. They give you a plastic smile. Oh, God bless you. <laughs> really? <laughs> we don't get down like that. No. If you're fake, stop it. You know, some people, they're so fake, it's like having a Tupperware party. Hope they don't know fire start. They're going to melt like butter against the sun. All right. Key point number one. Write this down. I'm giving you a bunch of stuff. It's popular to say, in God we trust while living in America. But that's not true if our hearts are not pure and dedicated to the Father. It's popular to say, in God we trust, while living in America. But that's not true if our hearts are not pure and dedicated to the Father. Like we said, again, Matthew 5 and 8, only the pure in heart shall see God. If you are not pure in the heart, you are faking it. You're not ready for heaven, my friends. Your authentic worship starts with the purity of heart. So the worship starts. I'm going to get more into this worship thing. But when you finish writing that down, let's go to Revelation chapter 4. And we're going to pick it up in verse 5. Hallelujah, Jesus. We're going to go a little deeper in this thing here. Show you guys some stuff. Revelation 4 and 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirits, spirit of God. Now, some people will read this and say, what in the world are you talking about? Okay, let me try and break it down to you. You see, thunder and lightning represents his presence. Because sometimes when he speaks, he thunders. You know, let me show you in the scripture. Go with me to 
Exodus chapter 19. I got to bring you guys back so you can understand what is what. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19, starting in verse 16. Hallelujah, Jesus. Exodus 19 and 16. Now, let me give you the backdrop. The children of Israel wanted to see God. So Moses said, okay, let's go meet him at Mount Sinai. So this is what happened now. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed. And a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a, from a ram's horn, and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in a form of a fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply. So you see, when you talk about thunder and lightning, the presence of God is there, and he's speaking some serious things to his people. And I can't help but wonder, sometimes I hear the thunder clapping outside, and I'm like, Lord, what are you saying? And oftentimes he's saying, I'm not pleased with the nation. I'm not pleased with the people's behavior. I'm not pleased with the violence. I'm not pleased with all the human foolishness that's going on. The kidnappings, the rapings, the, the murders, the robbery, you name it. The list goes on and on and on. How do you break into an 80-year-old woman's house and rape her? That is just ridiculous. How do you rape a five-year-old girl and you're a grown man in your 30s? And I'm thinking the wickedness has just increased and increased and increased. And I know God is sick and tired of it. Because the world has lost the passion to worship God. They have no desire to worship God by the way they live. They figure, oh yeah, I went to church. <laughs> Some of them go to church, oh bless me father for I've sinned. And the father's like, me too, <laughs> but what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen, let's not, despite our get straight away from when God is speaking. Notice in this area of scripture we just read in Exodus chapter 19, notice that the children of Israel didn't sing one song during this worship service. They were there. They were standing in God's presence. Oh, yes, right? What they had to do, though, they were, had to be consecrated for this worship service. Consecrated? Yeah. Consecrated means to be set apart, you know, as something or someone that's holy. And most people don't want to do that today in Christendom. Mm -mm. They're thinking, I will do Christianity my way. Thank you very much. That's how people think. But how many people are really saved? How many people are really consecrated, set apart to do the work and the will of God, to make him pleased with our actions? How many people really are there? A lot of people talk a good game. But look at what Moses told them to do. Same place in Exodus 19. Let's look at verse 14. So... Moses went down to the people. He consecrated them for worship. Oh, yes, for worship. And they washed their clothes. He told them, get ready for the third day 
And until then, abstain from having sexual intercourse. So Moses got them ready and tell them, keep yourself pure. Abstain from certain things that you know ain't good for you. So you can be presented to God and worship God in holiness. And that's what the church have lost over the years. The church have lost holiness. Everybody's having their sexual escapades. People are saying what they want to say, watching what they want to watch, listen to what they want to listen. They do whatever they want to do. And they come to church and like, oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And that is why half the church is going to hell. And that's not my story. That's what Jesus said about the ten virgins, five wise and five fool fool. Half of them are not serious about heaven. They're just doing their thing and doing Christianity our way will lead to decay. We got to do Christianity God's way. And that's why a lot of people don't stay here. Just Jesus, the minister, like, oh, no, this pastor too serious. He's taking everything literal. Okay. <laughs> you take it the way you want to take it and end up where you end up. Don't, don't blame me. Because one thing I know, my conscience is clear. I'm going to share what I get from the Spirit of God to share so you can disappear in the rapture. How does that sound? Glory be to God. I don't get too many amens, but I love you anyways. Now, you might like key point number two, or maybe you don't. But it's what the Spirit of God gave me, and I thought it was cute. Key point number two. To worship God with our best. Not second best now. With our best. We must sacrifice the flesh. Then by faith, God will organize a date with your future mate. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. I thought it was cute. I say, I like it, Father. To worship God with our best, we must sacrifice the flesh. Then by faith, God will organize a date with your future mate. Glory be to God. <laughs> there, are, there are many temptations out there. I ain't going to tell you it's easy. It's very difficult. But with God, all things are possible. It's not impossible. The enemy knows that if a believer gets out of line and start doing certain things, your blessing gets fall behind. No, you have to wait longer before God sends you the right person. Because the devil will send you people all day, every day. That's a given. It's easy for the devil to send you people. But to get somebody from God, that takes a little time. It takes a lot of prayer, a lot of faith, and at the end, you will feel satisfied. But when the devil sends you someone, it may be fun for a little bit, and then agony for a lot bit. And some people here can testify to that. We all been there and done that. I'm letting you know right now, God is the way to do things. If you meet someone and they don't love God, I don't, and I'm not saying like God, put up with God, or appreciate God. That's, that's different. You know, like, you know, you may be an employer or an employee. You may like your boss, but you're not head over heels about your boss and love your boss and say, oh, yeah, whatever. No. But for God, that's the way you should be. Amen. You should love God more than you love, watch this now, yourself. <gasps> Most people don't, though. You know, some people say, oh, but I do. I love God. I say, really? How much time you spend in the mirror fixing your face this morning? Uh, 45 minutes. Fair. Yeah, but, you know, you compete. You, you, you got to take your shower with soap. And, <laughs> and, and you got to, you know, fix yourself up. You got your deodorant. You got all these things. You got your makeup, all that. By the time you're done, it could be easy 45 minutes to an hour. And then you ask, okay, how much time did you spend in devotions this morning? Did you read your Bible this morning? Did you pray? Did you give God some worship? Did you spend 
authentic, genuine, alone time with God today? Now, these are the questions that are real questions to let you know how much you love God. Because people are quick to say, oh, I love God. Oh, I love you, Lord. I, I shut your trap. You're lying. <laughs> Just zip it. Stop lying. All right? Might as well do the remix. I like you, Lord. <laughs> That's what some people are. They just like God. But when you truly love God, and someone is trying to push you away from God, you step on the brakes and say, oh, no, 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 no. Back that truck up, truck up right now. I'm not going down that road. Because I'm truly blessed and highly favored, sanctified, set apart, consecrated man or woman of God. Amen, sir. Amen. Oh, if you're not standing up like that, you're just going to go with the flow. And I've seen it over and over and over and over and over. And I tell people something. I say, look, when are you going to stop letting the devil twirl you around and leave you on the ground? Just trying to help. I know what works. Let's get back to Revelation chapter 4. We're in verse 5. I know it's a touchy topic, especially for single people. But just remember, God is able. And after seeing what's out there in the world, believe me, you don't want anybody the devil going to send you. You want God to send somebody for you. I hear so many people say, I should have stayed single. <laughs> Because they married the devil. Anyways, verse 5. Right, we're back to verse 5. Now, we talked about the rumble of the thunder. All right? But let's deal with the torches and burning flames. We're not rushing through this thing because I want you guys to understand. So when you're talking to your friends about Revelation, you can tell them things if you're taking good notes, you will have your references. You will know what you're talking about and sound like a scholar that you are. All right? So again, verse 5, it says, From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. Now, the seven torches with burning flames is the sevenfold spirit. And that's the place where um, the menorah is going to be, the Jewish menorah. The children of Israel, you know, they have the, the menorah, they have um, the candle stand with the three on one side, three on the other side, one in the middle, on your favorite side, but that is going to be in heaven. And it's the oldest representation of the you know, Jewish people, the menorah. It's really the oldest. They, they have that and they treasure that. As a matter of fact, let me show you where it started. Okay, let's go to Exodus chapter 25. God gave them specific instructions of how to make it. Exodus 25. So the menorah is going to be in heaven. Some pastors won't preach that because they don't want no one to think that certain people is going to be in heaven. But I'm going to reveal certain things to you. The Jewish people are God's chosen people. Some people say, oh, they're all going to hell. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. Careful what you open your mouth and say. Because many Jewish people I know love Jesus. All right, verse 31 in Exodus 25. It says, make a lampstand of pure hammered gold. Make the entire lampstand and its decorations of one piece. The base, center stem, lamp, cups, buds, and pedals. Make it with six branches going out from the center stem. Three on each side, just like we talk about. Each of the six branches will have three lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. Craft the center stem of the lampstand with four lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. There will also be an almond bud beneath each pair of branches where the six branches extend from the center stem. The almond buds and branches must all be of one piece with the center stem. And they must be hammered from pure gold. 
Then make the seven lamps for the lampstand and set them so they reflect their light forward. The lamp snuffers and trays must also be made of pure gold. You will need 75 pounds of pure gold for the lampstand and its accessory. That's a big menorah. 75 pounds of gold? Wow. But God said something specific to Moses. He says this in verse 40. He says, be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. And I can't help but thinking the specifics of our God in many different things he says. Like key point number three, write this down. Then we'll talk a little bit more. He says, throughout scriptures, God made it clear that he requires a specific worship lifestyle. And the menorah is a reminder of that. It points us to the spirit of Christ. Throughout scriptures, God made it clear that he requires a specific worship lifestyle. And the menorah is a reminder of that. It points us to the spirit of Christ. The lamb stands, burning a sevenfold spirit of Christ. Don't miss this. We want to make sure that we are worshiping God in spirit and in truth. You can't be worshiping God with lying and being a phony, a fake. You can't say Jesus today and the devil tomorrow. That makes you lukewarm, wishy-washy. That makes you lack power. That makes you fail in your spiritual walk and not be successful in the eyes of God. There's so many people playing with church. That's why the, when the rapture happens, so many people are going to be left behind because they are playing around with church. They're not taking this thing serious. It's just a casual thing. Oh, yeah. You know, I went to church. I read my Bible. But are you the church? Are you living the Bible? Are you following God specifics? I hate to break it to you. If you're not, you're not ready yet. You need to get washed by the blood of the Lamb. You need to be cleansed. I know it's a tough word, but we're in the last days. And the last thing I want is for the rapture to happen and you come knocking on this door, our Jesus team ministry is trying to get in. I won't be here to open the door for you. <laughs> You're going to have to bust it down or whatever, do whatever you want to do. But I ain't going to be here. I ain't joining that train. I got to keep myself in line so when the rapture happens, boom, I'm out of here. I can't secure you. I can't secure mother, father, wife, son, sister. I can't secure nobody but Trevor. Everyone has to secure their own self. Back in the day in Jamaica, we used to say, every tub has to sit on its own bottom. <laughs> you can't, you, listen, this is serious business. You want to make sure that you're following God's specifics. God, to forg God said to forgive. Well, forgive. He says to love. Love. Keep yourself pure. Keep yourself pure. He said all these things. Are you doing it? That's on you. But I know it's a bad time to be playing Russian roulette. Our Jamaican roulette. <laughs> you do not want to play them games in these times. Let's continue. Uh, somebody's mad at me. Verse 6. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. All right. Now stop right there. This is a little crazy. Now, sea of glass. Sea of glass is like a clear 
foundation, a see-through foundation. It's not water. All right? I want you guys to understand what the scripture is saying. It is not water. I'll show you my proof. It's a glass where, you know, kind of like this podium, where it's glass, you can see, and it may look like the sea, but it's solid. And I'm going to show you the proof why I tell you that. Because I want you guys, when you're reading this and someone says, what does that mean? You can explain to them that it's a foundation where people will stand on. All right? Go with me to Revelation 15. Let me prove it to you real quick. And then we'll come back to Revelation 4. Revelation 15, verse 2 says, I saw before me what seemed to be a glass sea mixed with fire, and on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue and the number representing his name. All right? So that's John speaking further down, and he saw people now standing on that glass, glassy sea foundation. So here in Revelation 4, the rapture hasn't happened yet. People haven't been attacked by the Antichrist yet and all that stuff. So now it's empty. But in Revelation 15, it's going to be after the rapture, after the Antichrist carry on his antics and cut people's head off and all that stuff. And then those people who are victorious are going to be standing on the sea of glass. You with me? Okay. Let's continue to the next verse, because I want you guys to know the entire book of Revelation. You've got to pay attention. Take notes so you can explain this to the people that will ask you questions. Verse 7, where are we at now? Actually, verse 7, right? Yeah, verse 7. No, actually, second half of verse 6. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. Now, these living beings are watching out for the throne. They are cherubims. I mean, before I, before I show you that as proof, let me read on some more. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face. And the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Now, stop for a second there. They had eyes all over. Why? Because they are watching the king sitting on the throne. Don't think there's some little, you know, like we say in Jamaica, pia pia angels. They're not some little puny angels. That's what it means. Puny, like, you know, can't do nothing much. They're not some little puny angels that's going to have some little tiny wings flapping around. No. These are some mighty cherubims that say, hey, you're not going to go nowhere near the king of kings and the lord of lords. They got eyes in the front and in the back of their heads, all around there, on their wings. They got eyes everywhere. We can't even fathom those type of beings. Imagine you can see 360 degrees at all time. At all times. You got eyes behind your head. You know, you hear someone calling you. You turn, you have to turn to see who's that calling me. No, but if you have eyes in the back of your head, you would have seen them. And it may seem weird because the human standard is only two eyes, but in heaven we're gonna have creatures and different beings that you know are just different. They're created different. Now, let me prove to you that these are the cherubim, the, the mighty um, warrior angels that's around the throne. Let me show you what it says here. Go with me to Psalm 80, verse 1. Psalm 80, verse 1. Because you know David prophesied many things. And I'm going to show you what it says here. Hallelujah, Jesus. Actually, this was um, ASAP. Say it. it says, verse 1, please listen, O shepherd of Israel. You who lead Joseph's descendants like a flock, O God, enthroned above the cherubim, display your radiant glory. Because he knows the cherubims are right there with him. Look at chapter 99, verse 1. Since you're in Psalm, 
Let's go to Psalm 91, 99, verse 1. It says, those, okay, I went to the wrong verse, okay. The Lord is king. Let the nations tremble. He sits on the throne between the cherubim. Let the whole earth quake. So David, before the end was even revealed, right, knew that God was sitting between the cherubims, the mighty warrior angels. And in Revelation 4, John said they had a face of a lion, of an ox, of an eagle, and of a man. Mighty warrior angel, the cherubims. And they got eyes and six wings. I mean, I'll be satisfied with two wings personally. I'm going to ask God, can I get two turbocharged wings? I want to be flying all over the place. I like that. The birds, the birds got it made. They don't have to drive nowhere. They just fly. And they're gliding around. <laughs> you know. But I don't want to be a bird on earth. If someone may shoot me down, they go cook me. I don't want to do that. But, <laughs> but when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask God for two wings. Please, can I get two wings? I don't want six. You know, leave that for the cherubims. They're special. All right? I'm good with two. Yeah, I can make some, some trips, you know, fly over Brother Henry's house and say, Brother Henry, what's happening? There's <laughs> a mock sale in heaven, you know. Anyways, let's look at Isaiah as well. Isaiah had something to say about that. Isaiah 37, Isaiah 37, verse 16, had something to say about that as well. Hallelujah, Jesus. This is important to understand. I want you guys to get it. Isaiah 37, verse 16 says this. O Lord of heaven's armies, God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Now, Isaiah put the mighty in front of it. And that's why you know, I was I call him mighty cherubim because the angels are not weaklings. And every time an angel appeared to someone in the Bible, the first thing the angel got to say is, fear not. Because when you get in the presence of the angel, you're like, whoa, you're like mighty angel coming. Gabriel showed up to Mary and she was like freaking out like, fear not. <laughs> You know, even when he showed up to the, um, the um, shepherds tending their flock to let them know that Jesus was born, he had to say, fear not. You know, he have to I bring you great tidings, good news. Because people see the angels are like freaking out. They're like, they're humongous. People got these little tiny statues or pictures, little baby angels with short wings doing this. No, that's not what cherubims look like. Cherubims are mighty angels. So when you're explaining Revelation, let them know, hey, there are some mighty angels guarding Jesus. So no foolishness can take place. All right? Our key point number four, bringing it to us now. To be mighty in God's sight, we must fight to ensure that our worship is just right. To be mighty in God's sight, we must fight to ensure that our worship is just right. Because if you're not fighting and you're just going with the flow, you're not going to be mighty. You have to fight. I got to resist. You got to resist. It's just the way it is. I talk to a lot of people. And you'd be surprised what people tell me. Pastor, I cheated on my wife. Pastor, I cheated on my husband. You know, I killed someone, but I don't know what I should do about it. I did this. I, did, I hear all the stories. And you may be thinking, man, I'm not that bad. Well, you know, what did you do? 
telling a lie. Sin is sin. It's still sin. It's not like for some sin you do, it's a capital S, and the other sin is a small S. No. Sin is sin. It has to be dealt with. It has to be repented of. It has to be cleansed and say, I'm not going to hell because of this. I'm not going to let this sin drag me to hell. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to be above. I'm going to be, you know, sore like wings of eagle. I'm going to trust the Lord, live for the Lord, give him glory, and make it to heaven. That's what we do. We fight. We fight. And when we fight, we live right. When we fight, we talk right, we walk right, and we do the things that's pleasing to God, and we are blessed that way. Because God sees us as right in his sight when we're doing that. People say they're scared of the book of Revelation. They're scared because they're scared things in there. No. The people who are scared are the ones who are not living right. If you're not living right, you have a reason to be in fear. But if you're living right, you can smile and keep it moving. It's all good. You don't have to worry about it. You got the favor of God. He will work it out. He sees that you worship. And again, worship that I'm talking about here has nothing to do with singing. It has everything to do with living. Because some of the biggest hypocrites can sing, Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Yeah, but you ain't living it. Some things I hear about the, the Christian artists and all these things, I'm like, man, they got all these things going on. If you hear their struggles, you're like, they did what? Yeah, because they allowed the devil to use them. So I'm not impressed with lip service. What impresses God and impresses me as well is life service. How do you live? When someone look at you, do they see a replica of Jesus or a spitting image of the devil? Some people don't even like to see you coming around. They're like, see you coming, oh no, here comes the devil herself. You have said it about people. Because we all know people that are just Satan's representative. They're proud of it. You know, I don't know how I got on this WhatsApp group. I'm trying to get off of it. But there's someone sending out, you know, positive things about churches and praising God and all that. And someone responded with the picture of a devil. There's always someone that don't like anything godly or positive. And they figure, I'm going to throw a monkey wrench into it. And the administrator of the group did well by just saying, we'll be praying for you. Instead of blasting and saying, you demon, why you put it? It's not the best way to deal with things. Because we still have to show love to people who are influenced by the devil. Most people, and I want you guys to listen to the statement very carefully. Most people that we know are influenced by the devil. And here's the trick, or not really a trick, but here's the circumstance. They don't realize it. They don't. The best way for us to reach them and win them over is by the way we live our lives. So that they can see our light shine. Some people, you can't preach them. You can't tell them nothing because they know everything. You know those people that know everything? Can't tell them nothing. They, have, they can talk about every topic, about whatever. They even tell you about Jamaica where they've never ever been to Jamaica. Right? There are some people that miss to know it all and miss know it all. And people like that, you don't even get into an argument with them. Don't argue with fools. What you do is let them see by the way you live, that you are consecrated, you are set apart for holiness, righteousness. And God is living in and through you. When they see that, they'll be like, man, you know, you're different, you know, you're different. You're not like the other so-called Christians that I hear cussing down the corner there or doing that or lying and stealing this. You're different. And that is what we should strive for. To shine our light. 
to let them see a difference in the way we live. And when we do that, we'll be pleasing God. We will be exercising the best art of worship, the worship lifestyle. Don't miss this, my friends, because so many people go to church and they figure through they're singing some songs and carrying on that. Uh-uh. Your lifestyle. Yes, coming to the spiritual gas station to be filled up is good, but it's only two hours out of 24 hours for the day. Then you got the rest of the week. How are you living? This is what I want us to think about. Do we live like we love God? Or we live like God is secondary. We love ourselves. All right. Back to Revelation chapter 4. Let's wrap this up. Revelation 4, second half of verse 8. This is what the living beings do. Day after day, night after night, they're not just there guarding, they're there worshiping. They said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is and who is still to come. Now, whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And look at what they do. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you please. They are giving him their crowns, their most valuable asset in heaven. Their lives. It represents their royalty. It represents their commitment, their connection to God. Their crown is everything. Because without their crown, they're not saved. <laughs> and they take their crown off and say, it belongs to you. Worship. Giving God your very best. How long are we going to give God second best? And then expect the best from him? Makes no sense, does it? You keep giving God second best, third best. That's what you're going to get. But when you give God your absolute best. You know, me and my wife was talking this weekend and, you know, where we make it a big deal about spending the first fruit of our time every day with God. Every day. When I get up in the Wallace household the way it is, we are going to be thanking God for getting up. We're going to be doing devotions. We're going to, you know, focus on Bible reading and all that. Before we're sitting down and, you know, having a big old meal and hanging out and chit-chatting, doing a bunch of stuff. No. The first fruit of our time. The first fruit of our minds. We want to give God the best. Because when you get up, you're well rested, you know, you stretch, you scratch your butt, you do all these things. You get, you get yourself ready, right? And, oh, don't act like you don't scratch your butt. I scratch my butt, right? <laughs> you got to scratch, you get an itch when you get up in the morning. You're laying on the mattress so long. Um, so, <laughs> I just keep it real, and you know, I'm just a real guy. So then, you know... You, get your, you brush your teeth and all that, and you're fresh. You're like, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm spending time with God first. I'm not going to be rushing. Oh, I got to get to work. Oh, I got to get some breakfast. Oh, I no, bump that. Because you may run out there and end up leaving a poster on the side of the road that says, in loving memory off. I saw one yesterday. And I'm thinking, did that person spend devotion this morning? Did they spend the first Time when they first get up, did they give God the very best? I can't help but wondering. 
Because if we're giving God the very best, no devil in hell can take us out. Now, when it's our time to go, the ordained time that God set for you to go, you got to go. But a lot of times, the devil take people out because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Because Jesus in the middle saying, Father, you know, I died for this person. Have some mercy. Have some mercy. I know they keep living a mess. They keep doing wrong. But have a little mercy because I died for them. But there's a time when Jesus step out the way and say, okay, Father, they're not listening. And then the heavy hand of God come pouring down. I know people right now that the heavy hand of God is on them. And you're trying to talk to them. But they don't want to listen. Their heads are hard like this podium. And you try to tell them and love on them and say, look, you're doing this wrong. You got to remember Matthew 6, 33 that says, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Then everything else will be added. If you're doing it backwards, you're seeking everything else, ignoring seeking God and his righteousness. And then nothing good is adding for you. And then you're complaining. That's crazy to me. Let's get to the art of worship. Giving God our best. And let him do the rest. Last place we're going to turn to is Matthew chapter 11. This is an invitation. You may be watching us for the first time on television or on the YouTube or wherever you're joining us from. And we want you to know that Jesus wants you to be his follower, to be his disciple. To be a child of the king. That's why he came and died for you. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. In Matthew 11, starting in verse 28, it says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He said, Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear. And the burden I give you is light. I'm telling you. Jesus says to the woman in the well, listen. When you drink the water you're pulling in, Matt, in John chapter 4, that you'll thirsty again. But if you drink the water I'm giving you, you will never thirst again. He says God is looking for true worshipers that will worship in spirit and in truth. My advice to you, come to Jesus the way you are, and then he will turn you into who you're supposed to be. He will take the blemishes off. He will remove them from you so you can go forth with power. Don't ignore his invite. Don't ignore his invite. Trust him today, and he will do it for you. Amen. The art of worship is a lifestyle. Let's start living. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the reminder that you're not impressed with lip service. You are impressed with life service. I pray that you would touch every heart right now, no matter where they are, what they've been doing, whatever the circumstance may be. We ask that, ask that you just touch them right now and let them know that today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to anyone, but we have today. If you're here, if you're watching on the television, listening on the radio, on the YouTube, wherever you're joining us from today, it's your time right now to judge yourself so that you don't come into judgment. Analyze your life and say, you know what? I have not been given the Lord Jesus Christ, my best. I've been giving him second, third, fourth, fifth best. It's time to repent. It's time for a fresh start. So I'm going to lead in a prayer. And God is going to be listening to your hearts. If you want Jesus to change you for the better. The very best that you should be. Repeat after me. Say, Lord God. I confess that I'm a sinner. But today, Lord, I repent of all my sins. And I turn to you. Wash me clean and make me new. Thank you, Jesus, 
for dying on the cross for me and for being raised on the third day. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and stay with me. From this day forward, I am yours. And I thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. To God be the glory.